Welcome to worship. The Lord be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God, this day in word and song, beginning with our prelude. call to worship this morning is from Psalm 91, uh, Psalm 90, uh, Psalm 91. It's from the message. Uh, your, the words are in the, lyric, in the bulletin and they will be on the screen. You, you who sit down in the high God's presence, spend the night in Shaddai's shadow. Say this, God, you're my refuge. I trust in you and I am safe. Yes, because, because God's your refuge, the high God, your very own home, evil can't get close to you. Harm can't get through the door. He ordered his angels to guard you wherever you go. If you stumble, they'll catch you. Their job is to keep you from falling. You'll walk unharmed among lions and snakes and kick young lions and serpents from the path. Please stand if you are able and join us in hymn number 252, When Jesus Came to Jordan.
may be seated. Sympathy to Mitch Thompson in the death of his father, James Thompson, who died. He was 96. Uh, Kirk Michael uh, praying for needs, healing from cellulitis. Uh, we lift up Jimmy Poole. He had rotator cuff surgery, uh, needs prayer for recovery. Uh, John Thompson, prayer for recovery after heart surgery. And Gene Fortune, still in the manor at Kirby Pines. And Susan Batson. What joys and concerns do you have today? Um, prayer for a professor and her husband whose house burned down to the ground. Anybody else? Gerald Amanda and Isaac Gross. Linda Tomlin, who was ill. Ukrainian and Russian, Ukrainian Russian conflict, definitely. I saw one back here. Yes. <laughs> New grandson. Amen. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Join me in prayer. Father God, your love, grace, and mercy are new every morning. You are always more ready to bestow your good gifts on us than we are willing to seek them and are willing to give more to us than we desire or deserve. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for our sick and the lonely, those who are tempted and those who are suffering. Lay your hands on those who seek healing and their families. Let, us lo let your love surround them and let us surround them with love. Lord, we pray for your church which changes every single day. But we thank you that one thing that stays the same is you, Lord. You created us in your image, Lord. Grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression and that we may use the freedom we have in you to help us employ it in the name of justice in your name. Lord, we pray for our world, the people of Hungary and Russia. We ask you to hear the humble prayers of your people over there, your people around the world in your church, and turn their heart, and as they turn their hearts to you. We have so much to be thankful for. And yes, we have a lot of sorrow within us, but in and through everything, we have your son who taught us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the lectionary gospel reading of Luke, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Please stand as we read the gospel. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, 
he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If there are any children here, I hear some. Come on up for a special message with Mandy. Good morning, everybody. So when Mr. Jeff was just reading that Bible verse, one of the first words that he was talking about was the wilderness. And when you think of the wilderness, you think of being out in the forest, maybe. I know some of you have been camping, and you like to go out with your families. And I was a Girl Scout and went to a camp one summer, and we had to work on a wilderness badge. Well, to do that, we had to leave our nice cabins where our beds and all of our um, suitcases and things were, and we put a few things in a backpack, and we had to go out into the wilderness. And when we first got out there, the sun was still shining. We set up our tents. We gathered wood to make a fire later that night, and we set up camp. But everything changed once that sun went down and it became night. It was very different out in the wilderness at night. It was dark. If you didn't have a flashlight, you couldn't really see far in front of you. We had to get that fire going, so we had a little bit of warmth. But it was also how we cooked dinner that night. Everything was done over that fire. And when it came time later that night to go to bed and we got into our tents, it wasn't the same sounds that we heard while we were in our nice warm cabins. You heard frogs. You could hear the crickets. We heard some coyotes howling out in the trees or wherever they were hiding out. It was really scary because it was dark and it was different. And so when, when you're going to hear a little more from Mr. Jeff as he continues to talk about the wilderness and about Jesus being in the wilderness, those are probably some of the same things he felt when he was out in the wilderness. I was just out there for one night, but Jesus was out there for 40 long days and had to be um, away from everything. So you're going to learn more about that in just a little bit. So out in that wilderness, there's all kinds of animals, right? Well, do you know 
there are probably rabbits out in the wilderness. Okay, and what holiday do we have coming up where there's rabbits? Phoebe. Easter. Easter's coming. So with that, Mr. Mark, if you'll put up our little piece. We in children's ministry have a wonderful opportunity for you to support us with a fundraiser that we're doing. There is a special needs workshop for adults in Springfield, Missouri that make Easter eggs and they fill them with candy and little toys and for five dollars you can help us by purchasing a dozen eggs and we need at least two thousand eggs for a successful um, egg hunt coming up on April 16th so you can um, put on your check that it's for um, the egg hunt or you can use eGive or you can just also uh, make a donation in the office and we appreciate it. <laughs> so, find a way to tie in about our egg hunt and being out in the wilderness with those rabbits. How fun is that? <laughs> okay, um, let's end in our prayer. Jesus, thank you for always being with us. There are times when we're in the wilderness where we feel like um, things aren't going right or we just wonder when a certain time or a period in our lives will end. Um, they're hard. They can be dark. They can be scary. But we know that you are always with us and you're going to see us through that. And we are so thankful. Be with us this week in all that we do and bring us all back next week. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Mandy. As our ushers come forward uh, for the offering, join me uh, in this time of prayer. All things come from you, Lord, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. We offer ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering with us. We pray this in his name. Amen.
Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for um, surrounding us with your love and surrounding us um, with the beautiful weather we've had. Uh, God, we, we thank you for that breath of fresh air. Lord, we ask you to speak during this time. Uh, Lord, speak to our hearts and our minds and open them as well. In your name we pray. Amen. When I was studying this passage, I was um, very stressed and frustrated. Uh, some of you know I had a week last week where everything just kind of piled on top of one thing after another. Paper after paper, book surveys, sermons, and ministry, and family, and other things. And it just, I could not, I, trying to find a time to just sit down and meditate on this passage was not the easiest. And when I did, all I could focus on were these circular questions about this passage. Like, I could not for the life of me understand why Jesus had to go off in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, but somehow it wasn't God's fault. Is it an initiation? Is he being tested? If he's God in the flesh, why is he doing this in the first place? He ends up, he ends his words with the devil saying, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, it seems to me like he already, he's doing that to himself, or he's at least letting the devil allow it. And how come we only get three temptations? The scriptures clearly say he was tempted by the devil for 40 days in the wilderness, but we only get three. I'm curious what those other ones are. And why did he have to go to the wilderness? He could have just stayed in town. There's plenty of temptations right here. We don't have to go out to the middle of nowhere. But it was a never-ending theological circular argument in, with myself going on in my head. So one thing that always that stuck, sticks out to me in this passage is wilderness. When we think of wilderness, we think scarce. We think deserted. We think no amenities, no cell phone service. We think back roads, woods, quiet and eerie. If you read my devotion in David's email uh, this past week, I wrote about the best night of Rachel's life. The night she met me. <laughs> we met in the wilderness. We met on the Appalachian Trail in Roanoke, Virginia, on a mountaintop at sunset. True story. This set the tone for our dating life, though. This set the tone for a lot of, lots of times in the wilderness, whether we were kayaking, hiking, backpacking, whatever it was, we were, that's what we were doing. We did a lot of backpacking on the Appalachian Trail because it was pretty much in our backyard. And during all of this time of dating, I wanted to quit my job, not dating, and through hike the Appalachian Trail. If you know what through hiking is or don't know, it is when you decide to quit your job and all your responsibilities and start in Springer Mountain in Georgia and hike 2,180 miles to Baxter State Park in Maine and finish at Mount Katahdin in one season. And usually that season is from March, early March to September or October. It never happened, which was probably a good thing because I don't think she was going to wait around. But I still dream it could still happen. But besides walking for six months and who knows what kind of conditions or weather you will be in, the worst part of the trail can vary for everyone. Uh, a common area of the trail for thru-hikers to break down is 104 miles away from the final summit of the AT. At mile marker 2,075, you enter what is known as the 100-mile wilderness. This stretch of Maine woods is shown on the screen here. It stands as the last challenge for northbound hikers. They have to come through this 100-mile wilderness before reaching the final state park in Mount Katahdin. There's a sign as you enter that says, um, let's see if we can pull it up. I think I can read it up. There are no places to obtain supplies or get help until Abel Ridge, 100 miles north. Do not attempt this section unless you have a minimum of 10-day supplies and are fully equipped. This is the longest wilderness section of the entire Appalachian Trail, and its difficulty should not be underestimated. Good hiking. There's a few spots throughout the wilderness where hike hikers can tap out on four service roads, but those are still in the wilderness. There's nothing on them. 
And there's at least one hostel where you can grab a decent meal if necessity strikes, but it's going to cost you. You're on your own. You need to be comfortable carrying 9 to 12 days of food, unless you're a speed hiker and can cut the 10 to 12 day journey down to 6. They say it is remote and unforgiving, and if you haven't trained and prepared for it in advance, you're in trouble. When you through hike or when you hike, you have a trail name designated to you that your friends come up with or you come up with, and Beast, uh, a through hiker in 2018, wrote in his journal, I've hiked through blizzards, outran forest fires, dealt with flooding, severe thunderstorms, bugs, mud, illness, and record high temperatures for the majority of my hike. I have been fortunate to stay mostly out of the injury column, but apparently I was in need of one more final test, starvation. As I hike with a ration food supply, I feel very weak, and even this easy terrain becomes difficult. I have difficulty sleeping with a rumbling stomach, and just as I decide I'm going to have to stop at that hostel, we met a gym named Rowdy. Rowdy is a former through hiker, and she is spending the remainder of this hiking season doing trail magic. Trail magic is when you hand out generous food and drinks on the trail to through hikers so they get some hope. And in the middle of this 100 mile wilderness, she flagged us down and fed us sausage McMuffins and PBR. <laughs> Lil Wayne, another through hiker, in 2017 wrote, I feel stressed and exhausted. I know I can hike 100 miles, no problem. This is nothing. One week left but I know that's not enough time. I, I don't want to stop hiking, but right now I am beaten down and it's only night one. Four days later, she comes back to her journal and says, I am a new woman. Everything is dry because the sun is finally shining for the first time in days. I am rejuvenated, I am alive, the world is my oyster, and I am starving. The 100 mile wilderness is no joke. It's a place where McDonald's, cheap beer, and sunshine can make you a new person and remember why you are doing this. It beats you down mentally, physically, and emotionally. You lose hope. You question your decisions and wonder why you're doing it. But there's one part of that 100-mile wilderness, usually halfway through it for most hikers, that reminds them of why they're doing it. A day or four or five, Going through the 100 mile wilderness, hikers get a glimpse of Mount Katahdin way off in the distance, the final summit, the end of the 2,180 miles, the end of the six months of wilderness hiking, the glimpse of the end in all its glory. We hit these wilderness roads and trails and times in our lives, and we're just like these hikers. Our faith isn't strong enough to understand what's happening. We don't understand that God is leading us through wilderness roads to see the end in all his glory. We don't, our faith's just not strong enough to understand that, like we act like it is on Sundays. There's two groups of people I think about when I think of the wilderness. The Israelites, and of course, Jesus. In Exodus 17, Israel refuses to trust God's promise of provision in the wilderness. They forced God's hand by demanding that Moses produce water from the rock. And God gave them what they wanted because that's what a dad does. That's what a father does. But the relationship of trust had been irreparably damaged. And similarly, if Jesus had given in to these temptations, if he had given in to jumping off the temple mount... Presumably, God would have saved them. But that filial father-son relationship would have been challenged and potentially broken. True trust in God does not demand tangible proof. To put oneself in unnecessary danger is to force God's hand. To wonder the metaphorical wilderness alone is to force God's hand. So you see, the world wants us to believe that God tempts us into sin. God tempts us into trouble. And that he is the reason for our wilderness times. We face sin, we face temptation daily, and we are weak at resisting both. 
we've had opportunities to maybe get a one up or, or gain wealth or move on up in the company or whatever it may be by doing something unethical or wrong. But we knew it wasn't right. Something tells us that's not right. Is it God tempting me to sin? Can an all-loving God tempt, tempt somebody who loves them who he loves greatly? Well, the technical answer is yeah, he can, technically. But he won't. He can, but he will not. While God never clearly tempts anyone to do evil, he uses circumstance to test our character. In our passage today, the one who does the tempting is clearly the devil. He intends to thwart God's plans and purposes, and the Father uses the devil's evil intention for the good purpose of strengthening Jesus in messianic missions. The Holy Spirit plays a very large role in this passage. The Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness and demonstrates that while the devil intends these as temptations, once again, the Holy Spirit and God are testing Jesus to strengthen Jesus of his missions. Verse 1 mentions the Holy Spirit twice, at the beginning and once at the end, showing, showing that it is clear that the temptation was not a fault of Jesus, nor an accident. But, Notice the difference between Jesus' entry into the wilderness at the beginning of our passage and Jesus' exit in verse 15. He is led into the wilderness and is full of the Holy Spirit. But when he leaves, he's not being led by the Holy Spirit because he is in the power of the Holy Spirit. He is a new man. While he was full and complete going into the wilderness, he came out as a force of miraculous and glorious power ready to establish his kingdom and encounter the cross. We go down our wilderness roads with the presence of the Holy Spirit, but we come out in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are healed. We are a force, a glorious force bringing the kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, I could spend this whole sermon talking about temptation and, and the devil and how we should be like Jesus and not give in to temptation, and we know that. You know that. I know that. But we're not, so we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on the wilderness. In the wilderness roads we go down throughout our lives and the glory it leads to. If you were at Ash Wednesday on Wednesday, uh, you heard this, this chunk already in the, ser in the sermon, and while I don't like to repeat, it's very important to understand as we go down this grim road to glory, what glory actually is. We hear the word glory, we see the word glory, but do we know what it is? When I hear the word glory, I think of glory, glory to old Georgia. <laughs> Amen. They won the national championship this year. I don't know if y'all knew that. But this is their fight song. This is, this is every time they score, every quarter, it's, they, they play the fight song, and it goes to the tune of the Battle Hymn Republic. I've heard it my whole life, and my kids will too. <laughs> On January 12th, the day of the national championship, when I got out of the truck at church, the bell tower was actually playing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and I knew right then that the dogs were glory-bound that night. Glory is something we all want. It's fame, it's honor, it's beauty, it's pride, it's magnificence, it's significance. The Hebrews had two words for glory in scripture, signifying two different kinds, okay? So first we have kavod. I'm not going to teach you the Hebrew all that today, sorry. This kavod is the glory the world expects us to chase after. It is wealth, it is power, it is reputation, it is quality, it is splendor, it is the weight a person carries in the world. To have kavod would mean you had an attribute of a god. Second, the second Hebrew word for glory is shekinah. The actual definition of shekinah means to dwell. Shekinah implies the embodiment of God's attributes, divine presence, and dwelling within a person. 
And then we have the Greeks whose word for glory is doxa, which translates to praise, honor, and glory. And once ancient Greek scholar identifies doxa as the most glorious condition. So we have an earthly glory, we have a divine glory, and I don't know what you prefer, but I prefer Shekinah. I want doxa. I want forever. I want eternal glory. But if we're going to get there, we have to experience the wilderness. We have to experience these grim roads to glory and those harsh realities of life that we face as Christians, as people. We have to go down these wilderness roads led by God, empowering us with a spirit to be more like Jesus and less like the Israelites. So rather than blaming God and challenging God, like the Israelites did throughout their wilderness journey in the Old Testament, let's take this season of Lent, and don't limit it to Lent, be a season to examine ourselves. Are we willing to be led by God into the wilderness like we act like on Sundays and preach on Sundays and teach, like we read in our devotions every day? Do we have a healthy relationship with God? What is taking my heart and mind away from the Lord? How is my soul? Am I seeking to be like a God or more like God, Yahweh? How can I achieve my most glorious condition? I don't remember a lot of things I learned in Sunday school as a teenager, or for that matter, anything, but I remember a couple of things. I remember who my teachers were, and I don't remember much of what they said, but I remember one teacher, his name was Jonathan, and he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot of jokes that I shouldn't have learned in church. He taught me humor, he taught me a lot. But I remember one phrase we had in Sunday school, I don't remember what grade I was in, but I just remember the phrase, pity party. We were discussing Joseph when he was a slave in Egypt and the circumstances that led him there and his life there. And he said that rather than throwing a pity party for himself because of that, he continued to be faithful in his work. And ultimately, the Lord seeking God's direction. Our goal is to be like Jesus, right? That's our goal. But maybe, maybe we should look to Joseph first and try to be like him, and then maybe kind of work our way up. I think you'll find more motivation in that, because Joseph on his wilderness road focused only on God. Quit having a pity party on your wilderness roads and say yes to this journey of growth, empowerment, and faith as we get closer to Shekinah and Doxa total embodiment of the Lord in our most glorious state. When we are traveling these wilderness roads, we can be full of the Holy Spirit. But it is up to us to be led and to exit the wilderness with the power of the Holy Spirit in all its glory. Let's pray. Almighty God, whose son was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted. Come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations, who are on this wilderness, these wilderness roads trying to get closer to you. As you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is, O oh Love, How Deep, hymn number 267. For anybody who would like to come and be baptized, profess your faith and claim in Christ, or if that has already happened in your life and you're looking for a church home and want to join us here at Covenant, please do. We invite you to come forward, stand and sing.
getting out early, folks. So use this time for fellowship and enjoyment. And go get you a cup of coffee. But uh, hear this benediction as you go and think about it throughout your week. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again through our doors. Amen. Amen. Amen.